I was very relieved tonight to hear that Mike was not going to introduce me. <laughs> but I was very touched last year, and in fact, I asked him to send me a copy of it, uh, which he did. And uh, it was very memorable. But thank you very much, Bill, for that um, shorter but equally uh, warm and gracious introduction. Um, I want to start by acknowledging, as I always do at all Law Society events, um, that we are on the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, and to recognize the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples um, with whom we share the land. And I always pause on that when I say that, because I don't think that should become a rote sort of statement. I think it's something that whenever we hear that, we should pause and reflect on community and sharing and uh, the community and society that we live in, uh, the history of our treatment of First Nations and the need to reach out and reconcile with them. And in fact, um, yesterday we held our Law Society Remembrance Day ceremony in the building um, and uh, there were two memorable things about it. One was that uh, we honored all of the law students who had gone to the Second World War and died. And we used to call out their names and say, not called or never called. And this year we actually, with the help of Patrick Shea, who's a lawyer at Gowlings and uh, who has done incredible work on this, uh, we uh, invited their families to come and we gave them each of them a special call to the bar. And we had a display about each one in this room at a reception afterwards, which was incredibly moving. We did the same thing for First World War students a few years ago. But the other thing related to the traditional territory is that yesterday was National Aboriginal Veterans Day. And so we also noted the fact uh, of the thousands and thousands of Indigenous peoples who have fought for Canada and lost their lives for Canada in the wars um, for well over a century. And uh, we wanted to mark that as well. So um, I want to thank Jay for... Uh, hosting me at her table. I feel, you know, I know it's my dinner, but it's really your dinner. Um, and to thank Mike and uh, everybody here for, for coming here. And I, I gather you're having a very productive day. Um, we've had an interesting couple of days at the Law Society because it seems like just about every day is interesting at the Law Society these days. Uh, um, there's a lot going on. Um, the name of change was mentioned. Uh, we're confronting a lot of tough issues at the Law Society, and I believe that we should be confronting those issues. The world is changing, Ontario is changing, um, the profession is changing, the delivery of legal services is changing and, and probably will change in remarkable ways over the next decade or so, uh, in ways that probably none of us can even anticipate. So. Um, I thought I'd take a few minutes to tell you about a few of the issues that uh, we're confronting, uh, most of which will be familiar to you, but uh, and probably none of them are, are without controversy either. And I know there'll be a lot of strong views, and if, if, if you want, I'm happy to take questions um, at the end of it. I'm not going to talk about everything, but I, let me talk for a moment actually about the name change, because I'm not sure we did the best job we could have done in explaining how that came about and in what the information was on which we based it and why we did it. Um, one of our strategic priorities that we set uh, a little over two years ago after the last venture election when we had a, a, a detailed strategic planning process, incredibly detailed strategic planning process, um, and resulted in setting a, a five or six major priorities and one of them is communications. The sense that uh, we need to reach out to the public. We need to become more relevant to the public. And so when I got elected treasurer, I said, what are we doing on that? And uh, we had some communications consultants and we gave them some direction and said, go out and really figure out how we're perceived in the, in, by the public at large. How do we raise our profile? How, do they know what we do? Do they know what lawyers do? Do they know what paralegals do? Do, do they know how to reach us? Do they know how to access legal information? And um, the answers to those questions were not very good. Uh, not, not terribly surprisingly, but we actually you know that we conducted public opinion surveys, focus groups, and so on. And uh, 
one of the conclusions they came back with in saying you gotta, you know, there's lots of things you can do to improve here, but one of the things they also said was your name is a barrier. People don't understand the name, they don't get the name, they don't understand what Upper Canada is, those who do think it's some club or something, and kind of looks like one, and we like that part of it, but, and we're not changing those things, let's be clear. Um, but, uh, you know, that was, a, that was something we said we got to fix that. Um, and we also did consult with the profession, we also did surveys of the profession about a lot of issues around um, how we're perceived. And we knew that the profession was divided on that issue, pretty much down the middle on whether the name was suitable or, you know, not suitable or a bunch sort of said they didn't really care one way or the other, which is hardly a ringing endorsement. And we knew that they were split and, uh, you know, we said, well, we've got to listen to the public on this. And so we have changed the name. We took a couple of months. We had an identity crisis for a month where we decided we weren't going to be up for Canada and then had to think about what we would be, and that was why we sent out that survey. Um, but, you know, I'm convinced that this is another step forward. Um, my joke about the name change is this, that the problem was that we were Upper Canada for about, a, maybe at most 50 years, from 1790 to 1841. Think about that, 1841, that's 26 years before Confederation. And then, but then we, we struggled, we went through a couple of other names. We were Canada West, we were the United Canada, and then Confederation came along and we became Ontario, and I think we were up, listen, well, how long is that gonna last? So I think we felt that after 150 years with one name, we could safely adopt the name Ontario. Um, so the name is, is actually symbolic of bigger changes. You're going to be hearing about a communications plan that we're going to be, um, rolling out over the next few months and over the next year or so to make ourselves much more relevant to the, to the public so they know more about what we as a profession do um, and can reach us and access us so it fits into you know, a lot of things around uh, themes that we are addressing too around access to justice. And I'm quite excited about that. I think it's, uh, it's one way among many in which we are raising our profile which I guess leads me to something else that's raised our profile a lot in the last few weeks, which is our equity, diversity, and inclusiveness initiative. Um, I'm sure I spoke to you last year about the report of the um, working group on challenges faced by racialized licensees, and uh, many of you will have been aware of the debate we had a year ago, almost a year ago exactly, um, on those uh, recommendations and how they were passed unanimously by the benchers. Uh, which was based on real findings around challenges faced by racialized lawyers in getting into the profession and advancing in the profession and the conclusion that there was systemic racism in the profession. Doesn't mean there's deliberate racism, but systemic racism and the fact that we do not reflect the population of Ontario and the feeling that that too is not in the public interest, that we have to be more open, we have to be more inclusive, and we have to better reflect our population so that we can better serve our, public, our population in the public interest. And of course we had a tangible example of that for those of us who read the Globe and Mail on Saturday with the story of the woman, uh, the black student uh, going to Bay Street and then leaving Bay Street and the challenges she faced. And it's hard uh, for many of us, uh, and I look around this room, um, there aren't too many diverse faces, it's hard for us to put ourselves in the shoes of those who look different than us um, and the challenges they face in getting into the profession uh, and the need for us to take robust steps to respond to that. And I was really proud of the benchers a year ago when we voted unanimously, three abstentions, it's a unanimous vote in favor of a lot of robust recommendations that seemed to me to show that we were all willing to show leadership in this area. And I know there's been pushback in the last few weeks as we unrolled a couple of the, the implementations to this, one of which is the statement of principles. Um, that was part and is part of the strategy of accelerating a shift, a cultural shift, accelerating awareness of the issue amongst us 
as lawyers and as paralegals. Um, and uh, it's not a big onerous obligation. We've sent you uh, templates. You can write your own. I know there's a debate around forced speech, but we are a regulated profession and we this is part of a broader initiative, which I would urge all of us to continue to reflect on what is our goal here, which is to make us an inclusive, diverse profession that reflects the population. There are motions. We're going to have some more discussion. We had lengthy discussion this afternoon uh, about this and about the, the, the um, issues we're hearing from you and hearing from others. Um, and I would just say, and I've, I've been saying this a lot in the last couple of weeks, and I'm going to continue to say it, we're going to have that discussion. We're going to have a very respectful discussion around th this one issue about the statement of principles, but our goals remain firm and strong, that we are on the right track in making the, the professions more inclusive and more diverse, and we are on the right track in being proactive in that regard. So let me turn to another one, which is somewhat related to it, and I've already touched on it a little bit, which is Indigenous issues. I'm really proud, too, of what we're doing on the Indigenous front. Um, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission issued a couple of calls to action specifically de directed at the legal profession. Only two, surprisingly, perhaps. But there they are, and we are, we are responding to them. Uh, I think we are leading the way in Canada in our responses on Indigenous issues. We uh, have an Indigenous advisory group, which includes Indigenous lawyers and elders who work with our equity committee uh, every month. They meet on their own as well. They talk about what we should be doing to reflect Indigenous values, Indigenous culture, Indigenous laws. Um, we passed in June an Indigenous framework, which is kind of like an Indigenous lens uh, through which we examine everything that we do at the Law Society. Um, so that we can be focused on that and make sure that we are better understanding the issues uh, that they uh, face and that uh, our values and the steps we take uh, can be inclusive of them and reflect the need for reconciliation. And that includes things like enhancing our cultural competency, um, enhancing their access to justice. Um, and uh, these are important steps. And we're doing that in other ways, too. Uh, we've created an Indigenous certificate, in, uh, specialist certification. So, you know, many of you may have, be a specialist in civil litigation or in criminal law or in real estate. And there's a number of others, family law. Um, we've now uh, established the competencies and qualifications uh, to obtain a certificate that tells people that you have both cultural and legal competence uh, to address Indigenous issues, because that's a real challenge for all of us. Um, and it's perhaps the most revealing thing that I've experienced in the last 17 months. So it's 17, I'm starting to count the days down now. I think I, <laughs> I've got seven months to go. So what does that mean, Diane? I've got seven, seven, little, seven and a half months or so left. Um, it, the most uh, uh, extraordinary thing for me has been the experience and connection with Indigenous issues and the challenges we have there. And we've established a review panel as well, which includes benchers. And again, um, uh, the chair, the co-chairs of our advisory group to look at how we deal with Indigenous issues in our regulatory process at the Law Society, to look at how uh, we deal with complaints, uh, how we deal with investigations, how we deal with prosecutions, how our tribunal deals with them. And believe me, uh, very few people in this room, if any, I, in my view, can really say they have the competencies and the understanding to address those issues right now. Uh, we, don't, we don't really have it at the Law Society, and that's something we're looking hard at. And to help us in that, I, am, I actually uh, engaged Ovid Mercredi. It's a name that will be known to many of you, the famous first uh, chief of the Assembly of First Nations many years ago, a retired lawyer, who is working with us in northwestern Ontario uh, to reach out to residential school survivors and others whom we failed um, when they've complained about uh, how they've been represented and how our processes have worked. And so we're working hard with him to better understand how we need to change our methods and our, our procedures. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So I think, uh, so I got two more quick topics. Family law reform, I was talking earlier to Sonia about uh, this, because everyone wants to know what's happening with the, the Boncalo report. Our Access to Justice Committee has been looking at that carefully. There will be some recommendations that will be coming forward um, in the next days, I think, on that. Um, we are uh, uh, going to be making some recommendations uh, that, uh, that deal with things that she has recommended. It's going to be um, an incremental look. We want to deal with this carefully and we're continuing to look at those issues. But we have nothing, uh, I think it's fair to say it's going to be an incremental approach to that because really, uh, as we see it, there are a lot of issues around family law. Um, it's not just about representation in family law. I've made several trips to Ottawa to urge the federal government to create unified family courts across the province. We're still working on that. You can imagine the challenges with getting that on the, on the at the top of the Minister of Justice's list these days. Uh, um, her list is even longer than mine, uh, of course, and, and more challenging perhaps, but um, we have to look more broadly at family law just as we have to look at a lot of things we do on access to justice. Um, it's not in my script, but you know, when I mention we can't imagine how law is gonna change, um, a few weeks ago I was listening to the Batonnier of the Barreau in Quebec, the new, my counterpart. He's this 38-year-old dynamic guy, and he, all he wants to tell us about is artificial intelligence and, you know, and saying, get ready. And he's right. And I don't know what it is, but, and, I mean, who does? I mean, I'm not sure he does either. Um, but, you know, well, well, the artificial intelligence knows what it is, I think. But, uh, you know, these are the changes that, uh, that we're confronting. Lastly, I'll just mention LEARN. I know that uh, Diana Miles, our acting chief executive officer, who certainly has her hands full these days, is going to be speaking to you about LEARN in some detail tomorrow. Um, I know this is of much interest. I want to reiterate um, that I personally and the Law Society are committed to ensuring that we all continue to provide access, ready access, to legal information for all lawyers and paralegals, that we regard this as uh, vitally important to our mandate to ensure that all of us are able to provide competent legal assistance to our clients. And we're working, I think, very well with you to identify ways of evolving the provision of legal information and library services to Law Society members. And because we're seeing the same thing, of course, as we know. Uh, people don't use libraries in the same ways that they did in the past. Librarians do different kinds of jobs. Legal information is available in many different ways. And I've been at a number of, I think, very productive meetings um, with Jay and Michael um, and other representatives of uh, your association. Um, and I think it's fair to say we all share the same objectives. And I'm really pleased with the collaborative progress we've made. So that's, uh, I probably talked too long. That's all from me. Um, as I say, hey, I, I guess it's my dinner. If you want to ask me questions, go ahead until Jay gets up and cuts me off. Are there any questions uh, people want to take on or do you want to just get to the hospitality suite? <laughs> no, then I'll sit down. Thank you very much.